Romans. Everybody hear me back there? No clip? Can you hear me? I got a big mouth, don't I? I can turn it up. <laughs> he didn't answer me, did he? He kind of avoided that question, didn't he? He didn't want to answer whether I had a big mouth or not. Bless God. I can turn it up a Very slick about it. He said, I can hear you. Amen. Romans. Huh? I'm trying to be kind. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see here. Romans 8, we left off last time, many, many moons ago. At, uh, got, we just got into verse 1. Romans 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So there is temporary condemnation to the Christian who walks after the flesh. And when he walks after the flesh, he comes back under the curse of the law temporarily, and he reaps, <coughs> he reaps this, of course, in his body, not in his spirit or his soul. His soul has been saved and his spirit has been born again. But the Christian reaps it in his body. According to Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So whatever a Christian sows... To the flesh, they reap in the flesh. And if you sow to the Spirit, you reap of the good things of the Spirit. Because it works both ways. All right, now, uh, the last half of verse 1 has been taken away in some of the new uh, Bibles to protect the doctrine of eternal security. But I, I believe in eternal security. I believe if you're saved, you're going to heaven, but I'm yeah. not going to pervert the Bible to teach it. All right, it's not talking about eternal. Con <coughs> Excuse me, it's not talking about <coughs> eternal condemnation. Sometimes the word condemnation comes from that damnation word. Condemnation, damnation. Sometimes condemnation and damnation mean eternal, and sometimes they mean temporary. For example. John 5, 24 is eternal. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's the person that gets saved. That condemnation there is eternal. All right? And, uh, and then you have... Uh, uh, there's temporary condemnation to a Christian that lives after the flesh... According to Romans 8, 13, down here, verse 13, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. The last ten verses in chapter 7 has been dealing with the two natures of the Christian. We've just been talking about the two natures of the Christian through the entire chapter, chapters of chapter 6 and 7 of Romans. So now in chapter 8, he says in verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation. That's temporary. You're not going to go to hell. But if you live after the flesh, verse 13 down there says, you'll live after the flesh, you shall die. So God will take a Christian home early uh, for sinning. Uh, now how, how you know, God, people say, well, I know Christians that are sinning all the time. How's come God don't kill them? I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's God's business. That isn't my business. All right, there's a point to where a person can go to where God says, that's it. He just takes them home. God can take a person home through a number of different ways, obviously, yeah. all right? I mean, God could zap me right now. I mean, he could give me a blood clot in my brain or my heart or anything, and I'd fall over dead on a doornail right here behind his pulpit. All right, so uh, they, they, they take out the words who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit, the last half of this verse 1, the people that believe in eternal security because they, they believe it teaches that you can lose it. But no, there is, there is condemnation. It's temporary to the Christian in the sense of it's not eternal when you go to hell. And the, ten, the condemnation is down in verse 13. Uh, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. 
All right, now, uh, they tie verse 1 in with eternal condemnation in John 5, 24. Sometimes condemnation is spelled damnation. Sometimes condemnation is eternal and sometimes temporal. Now, Romans 14, 23. Look over a few pages to the right to Romans 14, 23, and look what Paul says over here. Romans chapter 14, and look at this word, uh, 1423 of Romans. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat. Talking about a saved person. Because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. All right, so he, if, you, uh, if you doubt, he that doubteth is damned. He's talking about different convictions and standards through this entire chapter 14. Some Christians think it's wrong to do this. Some think it's wrong, you know, to eat meat. Some think that's what he talks at the, the beginning of the chapter, Romans 14, uh, verse uh, 2. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. See? Verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Uh, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So these, this has to do, this chapter, with different convictions that Christians have. There's no really set verses about it. You know, there's not 10 or 20 verses on it. It's just Christians have different convictions. It's one of the first things I learned in the first 10, 15 years I was saved in the ministry. I'd go to camp meetings, man, a guy would get up and preach against everything. He preached against everything that moved. That guy would get up, you know, act like there wasn't nothing wrong with half the things the guy previously preached about, you know. And uh, so you've got you to work these things out with the Lord yourself. And uh, the, the convictions and standards is that type of thing. Now, look over a few pages to the right, 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Let me show you some eternal and te temporary condemnation and damnation here uh, concerning the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Verse 29, for he that, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You can't drink damnation to yourself as far as hell. You don't, you don't, nobody goes to hell because of stuff they drink. A person doesn't go to hell because of what they do. A person goes to hell because of what they don't do. They don't receive Christ. They don't repent. A person doesn't go to hell for murder, rape, Adultery, fornication, being a homosexual, lesbian, uh, you know, whatever. They don't go to hell for that. They go to hell because they didn't get saved. And they go to hell because they didn't get the cure, the blood of Christ, applied to their sins. Now, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine: 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The way that you eat and drink unworthily coming to the Lord's Supper is unconfessed sin in your heart and life. People say, I just don't partake of the Lord's Supper because I just feel so unworthy. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is you're worthy if you're right with God. You're worthy if you're living for the Lord and uh, you don't have unconfessed sin in your life. If you have unconfessed sin in your life, look what happened to some of these Corinthians in verse 30. For this cause many are weak. A, they're weak and sickly. B, they're sickly. Among you and many sleep. Three. Third thing there. God took some of them home. And then he explained, verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. You want to judge your own sins. That's what David was doing this morning when I preached about David having a revival. He, re, he was a good, he sinned, but he had, he's a good repenter. He repented. Yeah. I mean, that guy, you read that Psalm 51 like we read it this morning and dissected that thing. Wash me throughly, cleanse me. You know, I acknowledge my transgression. I mean, he didn't, get, he didn't say, uh, Lord, uh, I think I sinned, and uh, I think I might have done something that was wrong, but I'm not sure. I don't think I did, but I, I don't know if I did. I, uh, it wasn't none of that. Yeah. It was, Lord, I sinned. I'm wicked. I'm rotten. I'm dirty. I'm vile. I'm filthy. Wash me. Cleanse me. Blot out my transgressions. I mean, he didn't beat around the bush. Yeah. And I believe that's why he probably got extended to him the sure mercies of David, as I mentioned this morning. <clears throat> the sins of murder and adultery, there were no, there's no atonement for it in the Old Testament as far as the animals being sacrificed. And that's why he received, that's why it's called in the Old Testament the sure mercies of David. I think it's mentioned once or twice in the New Testament. 
Hebrews or somewhere. But the sure mercies of David are the fact that God should have and could have killed David, and he didn't. And uh, 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. God chastises and takes us out of the woodshed, gives us a spanking. That we should not be condemned with the world. He don't deal with you the same as he does unsaved people. That you should not be condemned with the world. You're a son of God if you're saved. So God deals with his children differently than he does unsaved people. Things happen in unsaved people's lives to get them to Calvary. To get them to see their need for Jesus Christ as their Savior so they don't die and go to hell and burn forever. But God deals with you and I. He he doesn't allow things in our lives, uh, chastisement and stuff, because he's afraid we're going to go to hell. If you're saved, you're not going to hell. But he does it that you won't be condemned with the world. He deals with... He deals with sinners and, and saints differently. Yeah. And uh, 33, we're for my brother, so forth and so on. All right, let's go. Uh, so you notice here in uh, verse 29, there's temporary uh, damnation. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. That damnation, that condemnation or damnation is temporary. See, the problem is we see the word damnation, we, we instantly think of hell, that the person's going to hell. But there's a, there's a damnation for a child of God. And it's temporary. Uh, and then in verse 32 is eternal. 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Condemned, the world's condemned. The world is condemned. They haven't believed on Christ. They're going to go to hell. So sometimes the word damnation and condemnation means temporary for the child of God that he's going to be judged. God's going to spank him. God's going to whip him. And, different, and chastisement comes in various forms. Just like parents, you know, when little kids are growing up and they're in school and they get in junior high or whatever it is in high school and the parents say, uh, you did this, you're not getting, you don't get the car for a week. Or, you know, little kids, they'll say you're grounded, you know, you can't, you know, do this or do that, whatever it is. All right. Parents have different forms of chastisement for children and teenagers or whatever. Well, God does the same thing with us, us children. God looks at several things when he chastises. He looks at the light that you had concerning that sin, the knowledge you had about it. In other words, when my kids were growing up, uh, let's see, Adam is 36 and Aaron's going to be 26 next month, right? So there's about 10 years difference. Ten and a half years, as he turned thirty-six in December. Nine, nine. Oh, nine and okay, nine and a half years. I'm oh, sorry, nine and a half years. All right, I didn't expect the same out of Aaron when he was six than I did my oldest when he was fifteen or sixteen. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, God looks at how long you've been saved, how much light and knowledge you have about the situation or the sin that you've committed. He looks at uh, how remorseful you are in your heart and spirit, you know, about the situation before he gets the paddle out and takes you out to the woodshed. That's what he does. He's a very tender and merciful God. Thank God. Amen. 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 Did you realize what God could smear my brains and guts all over the side of a wall if he wanted to? You realize the stuff that's going to start to take place? You, you realize the things that's going to take place during the tribulation that God's going to allow? Thank God we're not going to be here. Amen. 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 All right, let's go back to Romans 8. So uh, sometimes uh, it says in Mark 16, 16, and he that believeth not shall is damned. He that believeth not is damned, Mark 16, 16. All right, that's, that's eternal damnation. You believe not, that's... See, sometimes it's eternal damnation or condemnation. Now this here in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. That's temporary, because that's talking about a child of God. To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. All right? If you walk after the flesh, there is temporary condemnation, temporary in the sense of judgment upon a child of God. What is it? Verse 13. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. So I don't know what point it is when God says, that's it. You know, that's that's God, that's between God and the individual. All right, uh, you're on going on Romans 8, 2. 
For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. All right? Uh, the law is the law that operates in the believer when the Holy Spirit comes in. It's automatic. He said, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So there's an operative law that operates in my flesh that goes right on following sin and death after I'm saved. But I'm free from the law of sin and death. I'm under the law of the spirit of life. And that's what Paul talked about back in Romans 7, 23. Romans 7, 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity the law of sin which is in my members. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. See all the laws in here? The law of sin, the law of death, the law of this, the law of that. There's all these laws operating. That's why that law of sin and death continues to operate even after you're saved. In the sense of if you give in to the flesh, you'll sin against God. But see, after you get saved, see, you have something unsaved people don't have. You have Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you have a conscience that tells you when you get ready to do something wrong, and I get ready to do something wrong, don't do that. Your conscience tells you. The problem, a lot of people in America and around the world, they've seared their conscience with a hot iron. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2. All right, so they have no conscience. They have nothing that pricks their conscience anymore. They've seared it with a hot iron. There's no, there's no points anymore that pokes you. It says, no, that's wrong. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's conscience. Then the same person has the Holy Spirit. We also have a double check. We got the Holy Spirit also. You say, isn't that the same? No. We have a conscience and we got the Holy Spirit that tell us, no, don't do that. Don't do that. The only way that you're going to give in to the Spirit and not do the things that you should not do is if you're walking with God on a daily basis. You're reading and praying, reading your Bible, praying. you got a prayer life every day. You're trying to win souls. You're faithful to the services of God here at the church. You're hearing, preaching, and teaching of the Word of God. This helps you. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Your faith grows and you walk in the Spirit and you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. It's constant. You know it is. It's constant from the time you get up in the morning until the time you go to bed at night. You, you, you uh, fight the stinking, rotten, low-down devil, amen, yeah. and the flesh. Yeah. And uh, so do I. Uh, verse 3, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. All right? He says there, uh, verse 3, for what the law could not do. Now, that's the Old Testament Mosaic law. Now, there's three laws working here. There's the law of the spirit of life, which is the Holy Spirit in the believer. There's the law of sin and death, which is the old nature in the flesh. And then there's the third law that God gave, the Old Testament Mosaic law. Now, Jesus Christ condemned sin in the flesh by A, preaching against sin, and he puts it down and says, you have no right doing it. In other words, Jesus Christ lived on this earth and never committed one sin. That's what put people under conviction. You know what puts people under conviction? It isn't just what you say, it's how you live. When you get around, when people got around Christ, the thing that drove the Pharisees crazy and drove everybody crazy and they got around him is they watched a man who was absolutely pure and holy and sinless. Never even thought a bad thought, let alone say a bad word or commit an evil deed. Think about a being like that. Being around him would put you under conviction. Just being around him. And when people get around you, you and I aren't Jesus Christ, of course, but when you live a holy, uh, dedicated life to God, people can see it in your life. They can see it on you. They smell it, man. They can see it 
It just drips all over you. you got God all over you when you walk with God. Uh, Jesus Christ condemns sin in the flesh by A, preaching against sin and puts it down and says you don't you have no right doing it. And then B, he demonstrates by his life that you don't have to do it. And that's what people hate. All right? Uh, so Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. So some people say, well, he had a nature I didn't have. He was God manifested in the flesh, and I'm not. Then the Lord says, okay, if you recognize that, then why don't you trust him as your Savior? If people recognize that he has a nature that they don't have, and that he was God, and that he's sinless, why don't people get saved, you see? Now it says in verse 3, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not in sinful flesh. Christ didn't have sinful flesh. Jesus Christ's flesh was not sinful. How do we know this? Because after he was in the tomb for three days, he had not rotted. He didn't rot. All right? And uh, he, didn't, he didn't rot in the grave. And uh, I'm trying to find... Uh, uh, Jonah, in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 6, it says this, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars was about me forever, yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. So Jonah's body corrupted, all right, his body corrupted, and uh, but Jesus Christ's body didn't. In Acts 2.27, talking about Christ. It says that his body that didn't corrupt. It wasn't corruptible. So we see that Christ's body was incorruptible. Nevertheless, Jesus Christ's body was subject to the laws of human nature. His body was subject to the laws of human nature in that it was subject to the infirmities of the flesh. Hebrews 4.15 talks about Christ's body and being subject to the infirmities of the flesh. Now, what does that mean? <clears throat> Although Christ's flesh was sinless flesh, he still got tired and sat on the well there in John 4, verse 6, when the Samaritan woman come out there. Those, those wells, they say, were I've read in the commentaries, are anywhere from a quarter of a mile to half a mile outside the cities back then. So here's uh, Jesus out there, and this woman comes out there. So Jesus and this woman are out there by this well, and he starts the conversation and uh, about, you know, about water. Of course, he's going to turn into spirit, about spiritual water. The Lord was a master at turning the physical things, the physical, natural realm, into spiritual things in conversation and dealing with unsaved people. Uh, he got thirsty because on the cross he said, I thirst in John 19, 28. He cried tears. Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. He rejoiced in the Spirit, Luke 10, 21. Uh, he got hungry because Matthew 4, 2 says he was afterward and hungry, and he was tempted at, and like in all, all points as we are, as in all points as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4, 15. So he was uh, subject to, like, to the things that you and I are, but he was sinless. Absolute sinless. If he wasn't sinless, he couldn't be our Savior. Right. Yeah. Uh, verse uh, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Might be fulfilled in us, not by us. <clears throat> the Seventh-day Adventist Church, many of these people are dear, sweet people, but they're trying to fulfill the law and keep the Ten Commandments. They think that uh, you're supposed to observe the Sabbath. The Sabbath was, was a Saturday in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, we go to church on the first day of the week, according to Acts 20, verse 7 to 11. And 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, they gave the offering on the first day of the week. First day of the week is Sunday. First day of the week is Sunday. The Sabbath is Saturday, but... The Sabbath was a sign between God and Israel forever. Where's the verses on that? Uh, <clears throat> Exodus uh, or Ezekiel 20 
Ezekiel 20, verse 12 and verse 20, and also Exodus 31, verse 18 to 25 and through there. It says that the Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel forever. When Paul mentions the commandments in Romans 13, verse 8 to 11, he don't mention anything about the Sabbath. The Sabbath. You got these people all over. You got a religion based, and that there's several false teachings. But one of the false teachings of that religion is is that you're supposed to uh, go to church on Saturday. Now we go to church on Saturday uh, during the tent revival. We have Sunday to Sunday services, so we go to church on su Saturday night. But the, the, t we're talking about weekly services. We're at the regular weekly services, we go to church on the first day of the week, Sunday. We have a New Testament now. Why are people stuck in the Old Testament? Whole religions built on it for 150 years now. You say, don't people read the Bible? I don't know. I don't know what they read. Anyways, uh, notice here in Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Notice how that the last half of verse 4 ties in with verse 1. It says, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Therefore, the removal of half of Romans 8, 1 by a lot of the new uh, so-called versions of the Bible uh, is wrong. It's not, you know, not according to the Word of God. The King James Bible uh, has been preserved by the Holy Spirit that makes it real clear. So Romans 8, 4 is saying this, that the righteousness of the law is not fulfilled in the Christian who walks after the flesh. The righteousness of the law is only fulfilled in the Christian who walks after the Spirit. <clears throat> Notice further that the righteousness of the law is not fulfilled by us, but fulfilled in us. The righteousness that God requires is fulfilled in us when we walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Now the imputed righteousness of Christ is something else. But in Romans 8, here in this particular passage, He's not talking about imputed righteousness, but he's talking about the two natures that's in the Christian. Therefore, if you have a Bible that omits or leaves out half of Romans 8.1, uh, you don't have the Word of God. You don't have the King James Bible. And uh, thank God uh, for the Word of God. All right, let's go on in verse uh, 5, Romans 8.5. Uh, Romans 8, 5. Uh, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. All right, so there are things that are after the flesh, and a lot of people in this country and around the world, they go after the things of the flesh. They're constantly going after things of the flesh and, uh, and, uh, and not things of the Spirit. If a person is going after fleshy things, they pay attention to fleshy things. And if a person is trying to follow the things of the Spirit, they pay attention to spiritual things. That's what Romans 8, verse 5 is saying. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They mind them. It's on their mind. They go after them. That's their God. That's what they want to do in this life. That's what they... All right, verse uh, 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is is life and peace. For to be carnally minded is death. That's true of an unsaved person and also true of a saved person. If a Christian is carnally minded and lives after the flesh, it'll bring death, according to that verse 13 down there. In the context, though, it's talking about an unsaved and saved person here in Romans 8, 6. For to be carnally minded is death. Now, there's three different people in 1 Corinthians. We went over this in our verse-by-verse -verse study in 1 Corinthians a few years ago. All right, in, in 1 Corinthians, the first three chapters, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, the natural man, 1 Corinthians 2.14, uh, because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. The natural man is the unsaved person. He's just a natural man. 
you receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Then there's two things that are Christians. There's a carnal Christian, a carnal man. That's a person that's saved. And Paul told those Corinthian Christians, for ye are yet carnal. There's division among you. You're fussing and arguing like a bunch of little kids. That was a tongue-talking church, by the way. Are the church that thought they were spiritual? Yeah. First Corinthians chapter uh, 3, verses 1 to 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. For ye are yet babes in Christ. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? He bowls them out there in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 to 3. He tells them you're a bunch of carnal babies. And, uh, and, and so forth. All right, so carnal, is that's the way a lot of Christians are in America. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just telling you. A lot of people are saved. There's a lot of people in America that are saved, but they're very carnal. And one of the reasons why is they don't, they haven't really gotten into a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching and teaching church and sat under a pastor that A, knows the Bible, and B, is not afraid to preach and teach the Bible. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. And uh, so uh, the... Uh, They've never really grown. They've not become uh, solid in the Word of God, st stable in the Word of God. They've been tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Ephesians 4.14. We're to be rooted and grounded and settled for uh, Colossians 1.23 talks about. And, uh, and so uh, verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. And then, so there's a natural man unsaved, <coughs> There's a uh, carnal man, that's a saved Christian person, but they're just carnal. They're just, they really haven't grown. And then there's a spiritual man. All right, Paul talks about spiritual. Uh, he that's uh, spiritual judgeth all things. And uh, he talks about a spiritual man there in the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians. All right, some Christians are spiritual Christians, men and women. Some, of them, some Christians are just more spiritual than others. All right, and uh, some people grab a hold of the things of God quicker than others. I've watched that since I've gotten saved. People have gotten saved, and some people just grab a hold of the things in the Bible. They get into good church. They, they're faithful. They grow in the Lord. They're solid. They're stable. They're sound, and they mature and, and everything, and they, they go with God. And some just seem to have a battle with it for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. I don't know really what the, all that is about. I don't understand all that, but... Uh, so it says, uh, but to be spiritual, verse 6, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. A spiritual minded person, what do they have? Life and peace. When it says life, they're talking about abundant life. They don't just mean that you're living and breathing. They mean you have life and peace. Yeah. Yeah. That life there is like an abundant life. John 10.10, 10, I'm coming, they might have life, have it more abundantly. It's like Galatians 6. Uh, uh, be the so of the flesh, well, and let us not be weary in well doing, for we shall reap in due season if we faint not. All right, he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Galatians 6 7 to 9. All right, reap life everlasting doesn't mean if you sow to the Spirit that you're going to go to heaven. That gets you to heaven. What gets you to heaven is getting saved. When he says life everlasting, he's not everlasting life, is talking about eternal life. All right. But life everlasting is talking about the kind of life you can live in this life, an abundant, joyous, victorious Christian life. Yeah. That's life everlasting. Difference between everlasting life and life everlasting. Uh, so here in Romans, uh, so but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now that's true of a Christian but not an unsaved person, because the unsaved person is not spiritually minded. How do we know this? Look down at verse 7, going on, reading on. Verse 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Man, I'd hate to have a mind that's against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. See that? So here in Romans 8, we have a clear case where Paul is talking about the carnal mind of the unbeliever who is in the flesh, and this carnal mind will still try 
to get the upper hand in uh, the born again Christian. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God, Romans 12, 2. So, uh, there's no way that an unsaved person can please God. He might get God's attention like Cornelius does in Acts 10 because he gave alms, he prayed to God, and uh, he did all these great things, and his prayers come up for memorial before God. God took notice and said, Hey, Peter, get the gospel to him. Now, God don't take notice like that, but an unsaved person, it don't matter what they do. They can go to uh, religious services in some so-called church or religion or denomination eight times a week. They can give a million dollars a month to some religion or organization or church. Uh, they can uh, help out in the Leukemia and Cancer Society. They can do all these great deeds, and that's great, and that's wonderful. But they cannot please God until they get born again. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It don't matter what they do. It don't matter how sweet and nice they are. And you try to tell that to the average religious unsaved person, they get madder than a hornet. Yeah. You're basically slapped them in the face, so to speak. Because you're telling them the very best they can do to land them in a lake of fire. Yeah. Well, I think I'm pretty good. I do. I, I, the person down the road says they're Christian. I, I've seen them do this or that. and <clears throat> I think I live a better life than they do. They're always comparing themselves. Yeah. That's a that's natural thing for a natural man or woman. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Because they're spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 You've got to have the Spirit of God in you. This book didn't mean nothing to me, this Bible. Didn't mean a hell of beans to me until I got saved. I looked at it a couple times before I got saved. It didn't mean nothing. Thee and thou and, and the hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What's that mean? I don't know. I didn't have the author in me. There you go. Amen. You know why animals and, and human beings can't communicate? Now you say me and my dog. I communicate with my dog. Well, I'm not going to argue with you about your dog, but I'm going to say this. I mean, you could say, shut up. You know, the dog might know what you're talking about. Or you can say, come here, come here, poo poo, give me a kiss here, whatever. <laughs> Some people kiss their dogs. But anyways, uh, uh, anyways, you don't understand a cow or a pig or a dog or a cat doesn't understand you because you don't have the spirit of a beast. You can't tell your dog. You say, my dog doesn't understand me. I talk to my dog all the time. Tell your dog, say, here, who, here, uh, Rufy or Rufy or whatever his name is. Uh, here's twenty dollars. Go down there to the store and get me a gallon of milk and a, and a loaf of bread and uh, some uh, Hostess cupcakes. I love them. But anyways, and uh, and get me some and bring it back to me. He won't understand what you said because he doesn't have the spirit, a human spirit like you got, and you don't have the spirit of a beast like he's got. You know why man, the natural man, receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. They are foolish to me. Neither can he know them. You can't even know them. Because they're spiritually discerned. You've got to have the Spirit of God, the author inside of you to understand his book that he wrote. Yeah. And even then, we don't understand everything. Yeah. You can say 55 years. There's stuff, there's stuff in Song of Solomon, and Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah, and Hosea, Zephaniah, and Zechariah, Malachi. Uh, there's there's some, there's a few verses in some of them books. I have no idea what they mean. Yeah. I can tell you what act, what uh, dispensation they probably apply to, but I don't really know what the verse actually means. Like one man said, he said, if I understood everything in the Bible, I would know that somebody wrote it who was not wasn't any smarter than me. Yeah. If I understood everything in the Bible then I would know that somebody wrote it who's not any smarter than I am. Yeah. So I've never professed to know the whole Bible. And I don't know anybody that does. But uh, Romans 8 verse, uh, but that's why you can't understand uh, a beast, a, you know, a, an animal, because you don't have the spirit. And the reason why man can't understand God is they don't have his spirit inside of them. We're lost. 
unsaved, unregenerated, yeah. hell bound, that were born that way. Yeah. Uh, Romans 8, verse 8. So that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So there's nothing that an unsaved person can do to get to heaven except repent and receive Christ yeah. as their Savior. I don't care what they do. They can, they can do all kinds of stuff. And unsaved religious people try to do that. There are a lot of good, moral, religious people in this country. But they will not, they don't want to get saved. They, don't, they won't get saved. Uh, verse, uh, verse 8 says, uh, <clears throat> So that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now the Christian is in the flesh geographically, but not in the flesh spiritually. Or if you're saved, you're in the spirit. Now you can do things that you can walk in the flesh and fulfill the lust of the flesh, and then you'll be, you know, you'll be chastised, as we mentioned before. All right, verse nine. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. There it is. If so, be it the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of His. You know what makes you a child of God is having the spirit of God inside of you. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? The Holy Ghost is in you. What, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, which is in you, the Holy Ghost is in you, which you have of God, God gave you the Holy Ghost, and, and, which you have of God, and you're not your own, I'm not my own. He goes, I'll do what I want to do. No, you're not your own. <clears throat> For you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body and spirit belong to God, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20. Um, uh, Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. You repent, receive Christ, Christ comes inside your body. That's a glorious thing when you think about it. Yeah. God comes inside of you. That's why when you do something or say something wrong, as soon as I say something wrong or do something wrong, the Holy Ghost convicts me right then. I mean, just convicts me, as I said this morning, and the birds quit singing. Amen? Yeah. The birds quit singing. And when I repent and ask God to forgive me for my stupidity and saying they're doing something wrong, then the birds start singing again. Yeah. Amen? That joy down in the old, down in the soul. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's the unsaved man. He's a live body, a live soul, and a dead spirit. <clears throat> Jude, the book of Jude, talks about unsaved false teachers in his epistle and says that they have not the spirit, sensual, having not the spirit, in Jude 17 to 19. Now, every human being is like a tricycle. Uh, three, three wheels. Uh, you are uh, you have three parts. Every part, every human being is born, live body, a live soul, but a dead spirit. Ephesians two one, you have the equipment who are dead in trespasses and sins. Paul said, "I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ." First Thessalonians five twenty three. You have three parts to you, and I mentioned I've said this many times, and I'll say it again since we're studying this. Uh, you're kind of like a football. Let's say it's a football. All right. On the outside is the leather. All right. The leather is your flesh. Right inside the leather, if you if you open up a basketball or a football, you, you have they call it a bladder, and it's the same shape as the body. It's just it's just right on the inside of the outside portion. In other words, it's the same shape. It's a it's a usually black or dark blue. If you puncture it with a knife and let you know the air out of it you'd see that it has the outside, which is the flesh, and then right inside is that's a soul. It's the same. A soul has a bodily shape, according to Revelation 6. Those souls that were beheaded, and they talk there in Revelation 6. There's another verse that you put with it. I don't have time to go into Revelation. Anyways, uh, a soul. The man that went to hell, he said he had eyes. He could see Abraham afar off. He said, uh, uh, I'm tormented in this flame. He could feel. He had his senses. He had eyes. He had ears. He could hear. He had a tongue or a voice box or something because he was speaking. He had a mouth and teeth and tongue and lips and everything. 
Everybody that goes to hell will have a body and that will never burn up. And everybody that goes to heaven gets a new glorified body that will be wonderful and glorious and everything else. And then inside that football is air. And that's the spirit. And that soul, that bladder, that's shaped just like the outside the uh, leather of the basketball or football, uh, it's the same shape. And uh, as soon as you depart this life, as soon as you give up the ghost, you quit breathing, you die. Your soul, if you're saved, goes immediately up to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. You're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. All right? While you're in the body, you're absent from the Lord in the sense of being with him. All the saints that have died, hundreds and hundreds of years now, whatever. All right, all the persons, people that have been born again, saved. As soon as they die, they go immediately to be with Jesus. People that are lost, unsaved, if they don't have the Spirit of God in them, and if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he has none of his, verse 9, then they're lost. They're unregenerate. They don't have anything to defy the, the, uh, uh, the laws of gravity. So when they die, they go down. Hell is down below your feet. It's down. I don't know if you heard the story years ago with that Jacques Cousteau or one of those guys, uh, or those, one of the guys that go way down in the ocean and all that. They supposedly heard noises and people screaming and things like that. I don't have to hear that to believe in hell. I just open up my Bible and believe it. Yeah. All right? Hell is in the center of the earth, below your feet. Heaven is up. How do we know heaven's up? People say, where's heaven at? Uh, Acts 1, 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while, he was, and, while, and, while they behold, uh, and while they beheld, he was taken up. And, and uh, while, while he spoke these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And, when he, uh, and, the, and the angels said, This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as you see him go into heaven. Two or three times the word up is mentioned there in Acts 1, 9 to 11. Up into heaven, up into heaven. Heaven is up. There's three heavens described. Paul was caught up to the third heaven, 2 Corinthians 12. The first heaven is from the from the ground to the clouds. The second heaven is from the clouds to the solar system. And the third heaven woo, is the presence of God. Amen. Amen. So when I go on airplanes occasionally, go to meetings, I fly 35 to 40,000 feet in the air, I get way above the clouds. I look down at the clouds, out the window, way up in the air. But we haven't even gotten close to the solar system. Yeah. And we've not, definitely not gotten close. Paul was caught up to the third heaven. He heard unspeakable things which is not lawful for a man to utter. Yeah. He saw some things up there. And then God made him come right back down to the dusty roads there in the book of Acts. What a trick to play on Paul. Paul, you got to go back down there. Oh, I bet Paul, I mean, I'm not trying to add to the Bible, but I bet Paul said, oh, Lord, come on, man. You're not going to do that to me, are you? i got to go back down into that filthy, vile world. They beat me half to death, Lord. That's why I'm up here. I died. Uh, Romans 8, verse uh, 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be it the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Well, I'm glad I'm his. Amen. Amen. He is none of his. The Spirit of God will dwell in you. So thank God. If the Holy Spirit is inside you, then you're no longer in the flesh. You're cut loose from the flesh. Now geographically, you're still in the flesh, in this body. Now, as I mentioned many times, we're like an ice cube that's been cut loose from the sides of the tray. Your spiritual circumcision mentioned in Colossians 2, 10 to 12. And uh, you're like uh, an ice cube inside the tray. It's cut loose inside the little cubicle there. Pour hot water on it. And uh, they come loose there and everything. And uh, But you still have a tray. You're still in the tray. Unless you turn it upside down all the cubes fall on the ground, on the floor. But uh, when you pour hot water over that ice tray, that little cube there is a picture of a Christian. And now we, I, I drag this tray with me everywhere I go. My soul's been cut loose inwardly. When I die, it'll depart. 
in this body. This body will go six feet in a grave. At the moment of expiration, the moment you die, if you're saved, you, the very second your soul loot is already been cut loose when you got saved, your soul departs and goes up to heaven. And wonderful. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalms 115, uh, 6, 116, verse 15. Uh, Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know what Ecclesiastes says? The word better. Um, I won't teach Ecclesiastes sometime, man. That's a, if you talk about verses in there, it's kind of hard to explain. Woo. Read Ecclesiastes sometime. Uh, but a book, the word Ecclesiastes, you'll find the word better. B-E-T-T-E-R, better. There's a bunch of things in there. It's better than this, better than that, better, 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 better. And it talks about one's death is one better than one's birth. Now, we don't look at it that way. That's what it says in Ecclesiastes. Uh, all right, uh, Romans 8, uh, 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. There's the Christian right there. There's the Christian. He has a dead body and a live spirit. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Christ kept the law. The Holy Spirit came in to indwell you, and you have his righteousness if you are saved. All right? The believer has three positions. You're dying a slow death. Secondly, you're already buried. Thirdly, you're risen. As far as God is concerned, you are dead and buried. As far as I am concerned, I am living a slow, lingering death. And as far as the new man in me is concerned, he's risen to walk in newness of life. Got three lives. It's like a paradox. You know, Paul talks one time, he says, he says, I have continual sorrow. Uh, Romans 9.1 I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience holds a very witness, only do But I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Romans 9, 2. But you know another verse, he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, rejoice evermore. You can, how can you do that? A Christian can do it. We can rejoice evermore, but yet there's times we have sorrow in our hearts. It's a paradox. You can't explain that to an unsaved person. they got to get saved, Amen. Couple more minutes here, I'll be done. Uh, and so uh, then, then notice here uh, in verse 11. Uh, now he's going to start talking about the death, the dead body of the Christian as it's related to the future life. Look at verse 11. You ought to shout, run the aisle, swing on the chandeliers, and do cartwheels down the middle aisle of the church right now. Look at verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. By his spirit that dwelleth in you. You have the same spirit inside of you that rose Jesus Christ from the dead. Yeah. Amen. Think about that. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, his resurrection, is the same spirit that you and I have in our bodies. Yeah. That's why we got victory. Yeah. That's why we got joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. That's why faith is the victory. Amen. I have the, I've got the power in me that raised Christ from the dead. Notice in verse 11, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Uh, mortal bodies. Mortal. From this we get morgue. Mortuary. Uh, mortality. That's death. That's death. Back years ago, back in the late 70s, I was 